Hello, my name is Elena Kraus. I am currently studying metal smithing at Wayne State University and welcome to my presentation of Effects of Viscosity and Flow, the application of enamel on three-dimensional objects. Now, before we get into the actual research, I wanted to give you a very brief introduction to what enamels are because there are different things that are called enamels out there in the world. I'm specifically referring to vitreous enamels. Now, vitreous enamels have been dated back as far as the 13th century BCE and they've been used since that time in a variety of different things from decorating household items to actually replacing gemstones in fine jewelry. They did fall out of favor as the Industrial Revolution came in, but they've been coming back since that time. So vitreous enamel is formed in a very similar way to glass. It even has similar qualities to it. So it is started with the heating of raw materials like silica, potassium nitrate, and soda ash and then they add additives to it to give it different opacities and colors and different qualities to give you an array of options to work with. Now one of those could be cadmium, it could be added to make yellow, much like you would see in oil paints. So once all of those things are heated together, they're poured out in a sheet and allowed to cool. When it's cool, they shatter it. Now if you're purchasing in a commercial sense, then you're generally not going to buy it in lump form, although you can. Most people are purchasing in something called 80 mesh. So 80 mesh refers to 80 openings in the mesh of a sifter within an inch. So this would be 80 mesh. This is actually a pretty good sized sifter. We usually work with smaller ones unless you're working on a large piece, but this would be an example of what that would look like. And then this would be an example of what uh, enamel would look like in the form that I worked with primarily. There were a few other options as well. So you can see it's very, very fine. And actually some of these granules are still too big to go through this sifter. Now, how I got introduced to enamels was actually just before COVID, we had started talking about them in class. And then of course, everything went kind of crazy. But while we were working from home in the following year, we actually got kits of enamels to be able to try this out ourselves. And while we were working on them, one of the common problems amongst my classmates was undercoat white. Now undercoat white is very, very standard. Um, it's used a lot on coppers because it gives you that neutral color base to make your colors pop or as some of my classmates were doing, you can draw on it. So we all were using some undercoat white trying to get a feel for it, but people were getting pitting, they're getting holes. It's a very hard enamel. So I had kind of worked out how to get my undercoat white into a nice smooth state, but one of the things that came up is that we had a second white. That would be titanium white. And titanium white is a different beast. It's a lot softer white than in terms of working with it, not in terms of color. They both are solid white if you look at them. But in terms of working with it, it's a lot softer white. And therefore, when you put it on the first time, it was amazing. I thought I'd try it out just to see what would happen. Beautiful, smooth surface, which is what you're usually looking for with enamels. I looked at it, I said, this is great for drawing. I took some underglazed pencils, I drew a picture on there, I heated it up in the kiln, and when I pulled it out, there were these weird white specks in it, which I was not expecting, and they didn't actually work with my project. So this would be the piece that I initially had my experience with titanium white with. And as you can see, this is actually several coats later, I had added some more underglazed pencil and there's still all of these little white specks. So here's a close up of what that looks like. And again, they're cool, just not what I was looking for in that project. I was really curious about how other enamels might impact if you, like usually you put the hardest enamel first and then medium and then softer. What if you switch it up? What does that do to it? What if you do something like putting that titanium white that's a soft enamel first? And additionally, as I was learning more about enamels, I kept seeing that most enamel is either two-dimensional or it's a very slight convex or concave shape. So how would messing up those layers of hardness along with uh, enameling on a 3D shape, what would it do? How would that affect it? And that is where this project started from. So specifically, the uh, things that I wanted to study in here are the following questions. How do the 3D qualities of form impact the setting of enamel on a metal surface? 
What impact does the choice of enameling technique have on the application of enamel to a 3D surface? How can the viscosity of different types of enamel impact 3D application? What are the limitations of application on different types of 3D forms? How does firing time impact the final enamel pieces? How do different types of enamel react to the 3D application process? And what impact does 3D application have on the layering of different heat levels of enamel? You may be wondering, okay, you've kind of talked about softness and hardness, heat levels. So within enamels, and there are a lot of colors available, you have different softening points. Enamel doesn't melt, it softens and it flows. And that's what takes it from that glass granule into a beautiful smooth surface. If that's what you want, you can mess around with that. However, that was not the point of this particular study. So I chose nine colors that kind of spanned the rainbow because those different additives can have different effects on those heating, softening, um, all of those elements, as well as different opacities. So the opacities that are available within enameling, generally speaking, are opaque, transparent, and opalescent, which is kind of in between the two. The colors that I particularly chose to work with in my opaques were cobalt blue, buttercup yellow, black, and titanium white. I mean, I had to. And then transparents, we had uh, Elan Gray, Prussian Blue, Mikado Orange, Woodrow Red, and finally I had Opalescent Green. Now I also had some things that I consider basics, which would be Undercoat White, and then the three different hardnesses of our Fusing Clear, which we often use to coat things they're used for a variety of things, but they come in soft, medium, and hard. So I've got all three of those, and you'll see those come into play later on. In addition to my vitreous enamels, I also used liquid enamel, separation enamel, uh, underglaze pencils, and watercolor enamel, all to test how those would interact with those same qualities that I was pursuing within these enamels specifically. So for my firing, I did use a kiln. I touched on a torch, but I found that it was taking too long to heat for me to really see what I wanted to see from it. So primarily I worked in a kiln and I heated most of my work either between 1350 up to 1470 degrees. Now the 1350 is a little cool for most enamelists, but enamels can be fired from 1300 to 1650, generally speaking. I'm sure there are some that don't work one way or another and like Liquid enamel has a very specific temperature you're supposed to heat it at. So I chose to work with 1350 initially because I live in an old house and I didn't want to put too much strain on my electrical. But what I found in the process was that actually gave me a chance to have a better feel for what each of these enamels were doing compared to one another. Because transparents, different than opaques. And within them, the colors can, again, have a huge difference. And I was able to see that better because enamels actually heat at a very fast rate. Generally, they, they're only in the kiln for a couple of minutes. So it can be hard to see that exact movement at a higher temperature. And then in terms of metal, I used mostly copper with some silver foil to do these studies. Um, I did find out that Shibuichi, which is a copper and silver blend, um, can also be used with enameling in an adjacent project. But uh, my work for this exact thing you'll see is done on copper with some silver foil. Now let's get on to what you really want to see, the experiments. For my first set of test strips, I wanted to get a better grasp of the variable hardness of each of the colors of enamel that would be used. I did this in two ways. The first was to observe through the kiln window as it was being fired with that initial layer of color and be able to notate exactly when it hit its softening point, aka switching from a crystalline or sugar looking surface to that smooth enamel look. After that coat, I applied counter enamel to the back to protect it from oxidization and give it more strength, and then applied a second layer of color followed by clear fusing enamel. Now clear fusing enamel comes in three softening points, soft, medium, and hard. So by dividing the strip between those three and firing it first upright to get it all set and then flipping it and doing an extended firing, I was able to, or was hoping to be able to see whether that enamel would move into those layers at different rates. But enamel is applied in very thin layers, so I was able to see a little bit in terms of how much color would come through, but I wasn't able to observe a ton of movement just because of how thin the layers are. 
For my next set of tiles, I wanted to see how these enamels would perform on a slope. In order to do this, I applied two layers of three quarter color enamel and one quarter soft fusing clear. Once the top layer of enamel was bonded to the one underneath it, the tiles were placed at a 50 degree angle and fired for five minutes. From these, I observed that the angular flow was present but measuring from minimal to about three centimeters depending on the color. With the exception of titanium white, the transparent enamel showed more movement as a whole than the opaques, which aligned with their initial softening times of transparent enamels being lower than those of the opaques. I did several smaller experiments on the impact of longer or hotter firings and found that increasing the time did cause more of the counter enamel to flow onto the trivet, which would be what's on the back of each of these, but it had less effect on the movement within the colors of the enamel than increasing the temperature. As you can see here, the black, which is a harder enamel, still has very clear edges along it. Now, I say clear edges, but I mean, if you look, it's very sharp around those little black speckles in there, whereas the titanium white has this cloudy appearance and these tendrils that are starting to come down, same as the wood row red, which is a softer transparent enamel. For my next set of tiles, I wanted to see how a soft enamel would function underneath a harder enamel. So I applied two layers of color onto each of these tiles and then followed them with a layer of undercoat white, which as I've said before is a hard white. So I did the firing for these and I even tried upsetting them, so putting them upside down. Uh, I did extended firings on a few of them and as you can see, not a lot of color came through here. Now these were not done on any sort of slope. They were strictly to see how those colors would come between the layers. You can see that some of them, there's more color coming through than others. Those would be transparent as far as I can tell. If I redid this particular experiment, I wouldn't apply the undercoat white over the entire tile so that I would have a better grasp of which color is underneath the undercoat white. For my final set of tiles, I started with a layer of titanium white and then added two coats of another color from my sample set to half of each tile. These tiles were finished with a split in the opposite direction of soft and hard fusing clear, then flipped for a final firing. This allowed me to observe multiple hardness factors within context of each other. These were also completed at a higher firing temperature of 1470. While each color varied in the amount of movement between the three enamel layers, the transparent enamels saw a more obvious development of movement. This less restricted movement on the soft fusing clear side resulted in larger, softer cells of pull through, whereas the hard fusing clear had smaller, more contained patterns of pull through. Another observation from this set is the impact of the number of layers in this interplay. In an attempt for better coverage, there's one more layer of cobalt blue than of black. Both being opaque and of similar softening points, the difference in pull through with that extra layer is visibly apparent. This decrease in movement with the application of additional, particularly harder layers will also be observable in my final pieces. For my next phase of testing, I moved on to tower shapes. So these were three-dimensional, though still largely flat-sided, created from folding and rolling sheet copper. These towers varied in being split by color across a horizontal line or layered with different softening points of enamel. As with the tiles, they showed a greater tendency for movement between layers of enamel than with gravity. In addition to the towers, I also made several small scale objects that focused on curved and curled edges. These pieces showcase the difficulty in achieving and maintaining an even application of enamel on three dimensional objects that had already begun to manifest in the towers. They also exhibited a tendency towards chipping along the edges, as is particularly clear on the blue spiral, as well as oxidization showing through curved sections in the orange ribbon. Before proceeding to the application phase of my project, I took my observations from previous work and combined them with four hydraulically pressed copper moons. Each moon was enameled with a layer of Prussian blue, followed by a layer of titanium white, and finished with a layer of buttercup yellow. Now, the differences that we see between these moons come from the differences in heating temperatures and the duration that they're in the kiln. So the two with the circles on top were both heated at 1350, whereas the two without the circles were at 1470. On the left hand side, those were fired at shorter durations, so five and three minutes respectively, while the ones on the right were at extended durations. What we see from that is that these shorter durations, you end up with these smaller cells, and there's more of the yellow that remains on there. And I did do extended 
extended comparative to what would be considered normal enamel on all of these. But still, the ones on the left, you see a lot more of that yellow and again that smaller cell structure. Whereas the moons that are on the right that were for the extended firing, you still see a smaller cell structure on the 1350 moon, which is the one that's here, but you can see it's almost all white, whereas this one is the 1470 extended firing, and you see a larger cell structure with that transparent blue really coming up from the bottom. The final phase of my project was the application phase. During this phase, I created a series of work focused on form that varied in dimensionality from a low dome relief all the way up to a large fold form piece, which is about six and a quarter square by three and a quarter tall. And that size limitation is based on the size of the kiln itself. In this phase, I also introduced those alternate enamel types like separation enamel, liquid enamel, and silver leaf to select pieces. One of the most difficult aspects of this phase was the actual application of the enamel itself. Applying sifted enamel evenly onto curves, edges, and sides proved to be complex. For most pieces, this meant applying the enamel to one section, allowing it to dry, and carefully, carefully rotating the piece to apply the next section without knocking loose the enamel that had already been applied. To aid in this, I often use elements like trivets and enamel containers from around my workspace to prop items for the best angle of application. The even coating of enamel is most important in the first layer to prevent oxides from forming on the surface from the heat of the kiln. To make sure that adequate enamel was in play to overcome the tension of edges on hard folded and pressed objects, I paid particular attention to packing those lines with extra enamel to make certain that when the enamel hit its softening point, it wouldn't flow away completely from the edge but maintain tension around it. Wet packing the enamel on these edges proved to be particularly beneficial. This had to be checked with every firing as those edges were most likely to pull away and leave oxidization even after the first firing. I did want to point out a few instances that refer specifically to the things that I was looking at in this study. So this little ghost fellow has multiple layers of undercoat white mixed with titanium white and then there's just that little hint of black and wood row red along the edge. And if you look closely here, you can see that movement both between the layers, so that pull through that's happening, both of the wood row red and the titanium white with that um, undercoat white, and also this swirling, gravity-driven movement that is available in this section of the piece. This also was observed after I wrote my report, so it will be added to it later, but I had done this fold form piece as a sample piece initially, and I decided to come back and add an additional layer of Elan Gray. I was just curious if I could pull up those colors from underneath in it. I put it in at a angle and fired for an extended period of time, and when I pulled it out, you can see where these colors have now separated. Now, before it went into the firing, you could see little dots of the transparent coming through, but it was primarily cobalt blue. Now in this after firing piece, it's actually divided into three colors. You can see the gray, the blue, and there was some opalescent green in there that have all appeared. And it also has actually moved so that the lower section of the piece has thicker enamel than the upper section. Here are a few final pieces. Thank you for joining me, and I hope you have a fabulous rest of your day.